The degrees of freedom for the analysis of variance decompose in the same way as our sums of squares. Remember, our sums of squares total was simply broken apart into sums of squares for error and sums of squares for treatment. Degrees of freedom simply represent how much independent information we have, and what we're going to do is allocate some of that independent information to the sums of squares for treatment and some of it to the sums of squares for error. So, our degrees of freedom total, the total amount of information we have in the data set, is simply going to be one part degrees of freedom error and one part degrees of freedom treatment. Let's step forward to the sums of squares total. The sums of squares total would simply be the sums of squares we would have if we didn't even consider any factors. That is, if we simply had a data set of y observations and we wanted to calculate a variance. So, just like we saw before when we were calculating variances, we divide those sums of squares by n minus 1. n here is just the total number of people we have in the entire sample, ignoring group. So the degrees of freedom total is simply n total minus 1. That is the total amount of independent information we have in our sample in order to estimate a population variance. But now we're going to break apart that n total minus 1 degrees of freedom into separate pieces, one part for treatment and one part for error. Stepping forward, we can see that the sums of squares for treatment are simply calculated on the basis of the t's, the treatment offsets we have in our sample. And the degrees of freedom for these sums of squares for treatment are simply j minus 1, where j is the number of groups we have. Let's see why this is the case. There's a restriction on our data, like there always is when we're taking offsets from some mean. Here are the different t's for our different groups. So the T for Delta, Southwest, and Virgin America. You may have noticed something about these, which is that they all revolve around zero. So there's a restriction we have in our data. That is, the sum of the T sub J's has to be zero. And that's a simple consequence of the calculation we did to get these T's. That is, we found the deviation of those individual groups from the grand mean. So it had to be the case that the sum of these is zero. What that means is, if I were to tell you two of these treatment offsets, you could calculate the third without knowing anything else. Think about this. If I were to tell you t sub 1 is 11.80, and t sub 2 is negative 3.47, and you knew that there was a t3, and that the sum of all the t's had to be zero, it's just some simple arithmetic to find that t sub 3 is equal to negative 8.33. So degrees of freedom is simply a representation of how many of these points or how many of these values are independent. You only need to know two and you can calculate the third. So there is, for any sums of squares treatment, j minus one degrees of freedom. Finally, we have the sums of squares for error, which use up the remaining degrees of freedom we have in our data set. One way to look at this is that it's the number of observations in each group minus one then add it up across the number of groups we have. Another way to think of degrees of freedom is a counter for the number of things we estimated. So every time we estimate a population parameter, we lose a degree of freedom. A final way to calculate degrees of freedom for error is taking the total number of observations we have minus the degrees of freedom we use for our treatment offsets minus the one degree of freedom we used for calculating the grand mean. Notice that these degrees of freedom, like the sums of squares, simply add up. The degrees of freedom for error plus the degrees of freedom for treatment simply equal the degrees of freedom total. For our particular data set, we can see it this way. The degrees of freedom for error is 100 minus 3 minus 1, the two degrees of freedom for our treatment, minus 1, plus the degrees of freedom for treatment, 3 minus 1, which equals the total degrees of freedom, the number of observations we had simply minus 1. So 97 plus 2 really does equal 99. And notice what this lets us do now. Now we know what f statistic we can calculate. We know what f distribution we're likely to get if the null hypothesis is true. That is, the denominators of our mean squares, the sums of squares for treatment and the sums of squares for error, is what defines that fischer snedeker distribution. Remember, we simply needed the degrees of freedom from the numerator and the degrees of freedom for the denominator in order to draw the fischer snedeker distribution. So that's what we can draw here. Here is the fischer snedeker with two numerator degrees of freedom and 97 denominator degrees of freedom.
And this is the distribution of F statistics we should get if the null hypothesis is true. Said differently, this is the sampling distribution of the F statistic under the null hypothesis. So if the null hypothesis is true, these are the values of F we should get, which means we can designate an area, a critical region, equal to alpha like we've done before. And if the null hypothesis is true, these would be unlikely values of F to get. But if the null hypothesis is false, and that mean square for treatment is actually larger, that is, it has systematic variance in addition to error variance, then we should expect larger values of F. So, with this distribution and this formulation of our mathematical model, we can test whether we got an unlikely amount of treatment offset differences, differences from zero, than we should expect by chance alone. So now, we have all the inferential methods we need in order to test factors rather than simply individual means.